Hello, Personal Finance Club. It is so great to see you guys. We have 972 already here on the moment of the top of the hour. That's great. Way to be on time. If I know human behavior, there's going to be a lot more people filtering in, but we're not going to wait for them because you guys show up on time. And so we're going to get started right now. Welcome to the webinar. I'm actually super pumped that you're here. Okay, let's jump ahead. Uh, this is how to invest in index funds for the next 59 minutes or so. I'm going to pump this hour full of everything I can to get you guys started in understanding what they are, how they work, why they're great, why they're the optimal way to invest, and then actually like what buttons to click to do it. It's going to be the whole thing. So like if you can put away the phone, close the other tabs, like give me your attention for the next 59 minutes. I think it will make you, you know, millions of dollars over the course of your career. So probably worth it. Um, who is this guy? I think you probably know who I am. Uh, Molly, probably follow me and Vivi on Instagram at Personal Finance Club. Um, but I'm Jeremy. I retired at 36 years old. I am now 40. So I've been living, you know, the dream, I guess, for four years. My net worth is over $4 million. It's actually about $4.5 million. One of the cool things about having invested assets is that they keep kind of going up on their own, which is awesome. Um, I know a lot about personal finance and investing. And I do this because I love it. This is after I kind of retired and quit my job, I started Personal Finance Club because I was like casually helping all my friends do this exact same thing, understand the Roth IRA and index funds. And then I started my Instagram to share this information. And just like my passion, like some people like skydiving or, you know, long distance running or some much more exciting things. I like boring things like index funds, but hopefully it's good for you because it'll make you rich. And, you know, by the way, it has kind of become like a new business now, uh, which is why we hired Avivi and maybe soon to be even more. Um, okay, so I think many of you know, I've seen some chatter in the chat, some buzz in the chat, we're doing a giveaway. And so this is how it's gonna work. We're giving away 10 copies of the full course at the end of the hour. So this this is like kind of the condensed, like, you know, cliff notes as much as I can fit in an hour. There's a full course, I'll talk about more. Um, to enter, wait, before I even show this, the way you enter is you put your name in the chat, but you can only put your name in the chat once. If you put your name in the chat twice, we are gonna, throw into Excel and we're going to remove the duplicates and we're going to sort it so there's you can't like change your name or anything. So put your name, your first name, your last initial in your current city into the chat now. So for example, I would type Jeremy S. San Diego and then uh, you have exactly 59 seconds left to do this. I see those names starting to fly in. Amazing. So you put your name sitting in the chat. Uh, one entry per person, like I said. And uh, yeah, we're going to announce the winners at the end. So throw those names in. This is your time to just totally spam the chat. We've got 1,400 people live with us right now, which is amazing. By the way, a little fun fact about this webinar. Uh, our like subscription to this thing allows for 2,000 live attendees. Um, we expect to hit that. So congrats to you guys for getting here on time because that's how you enter into the giveaway and that's also how you get your spot. Um, we might cap out at that 2,000. And if so, uh, apologies to those people who didn't make it in. Okay, I'm gonna give you 15 more seconds to to uh, spam the, your name in the chat there. That's how you enter to win the 10 free copies of the PFC course on index funds. And then yeah, stick around to the end because you kind of got to be here to win. And you know we do this to trick you into watching until the end so that you can learn about index funds. Sweet. Okay, entries are closed. So right now. Vivi is downloading this, the uh, chat log. Any names that you type in after this point will not be entered. So save your typing. And because uh, we're going to get started with the good stuff. Here we go. We're four minutes in. Now we're getting to the really fun stuff. Okay. So if you guys follow me on Instagram, you probably know I end every single one of my posts with the two rules of building wealth. Those rules are rule number one, live below your means. I mean, spend less money than you make. And rule number two is invest early and often. And so it's simple, it might seem obvious, but this is actually how rich people get rich. They spend less money than they make, and with that money that they don't spend, they invest it as soon as they get it, early and often. The combination of those two things is how you build wealth. If you spend all your money and you have nothing else to invest, you're broke. Even if you make half a million dollars a year and you spend half a million dollars a year, at the end of the year, you got zero. That's called being broke. But if you make 50,000 a year and you invest, or you spend 40,000 a year, and you invest 10,000 a year, you're gonna easily be a millionaire over your career and probably a multimillionaire. So you could go on, you could go on for days about frugality, budgeting, 
coupon, extreme couponing, all the stuff that is living below your means. But in this hour, we're going to talk only about rule number two, investing early and often. Hopefully that's why you're here. We're going to get to it. Okay. So here it comes. I'm going to start off with one of my favorite types of things to do, emoji examples. So we're going to talk about Ashley and Amanda, our two little emojis here. And both Ashley and Amanda are trying to build wealth. And actually, Ashley saves $500 per month. And she puts her $500 a month into a high yield savings account. What a great name. It's got the words high yield baked right into it. And it gets 2%. And you might be saying to yourself right now, where on earth do I get a high yield savings account that pays that much? Because right now, none of them do. And that's true. But just, you know, let's just give Ashley the benefit of the doubt here. And let's say she finds a high yield savings account. Um, Amanda saves the exact same $500 a month. So they're both equally applying rule number one. They're both living below their means to the tune of $500 per month. But instead of putting it into a savings account, Amanda puts it into an index fund, getting a 10% return on average. So, you know, pretty similar here. They're both saving 500 bucks a month, 2%, 10%. Is that a big deal? Let's find out. So what happens? I might need to move my little, uh, my little face here. So uh, I might do that to avoid being in the way. So hopefully that avoids being in the way. Okay, so what happens? This blue line here is saving $500 a month over the course of 40 years. If you say $500 a month, that's $6,000 a year times 40 years is $240,000. If you just put the money under your mattress or buried in your backyard, that's how much money you have. But that's not what Ashley does, right? Here comes Ashley. She puts into that high yield savings account. And how much does she make with 2% interest? Because every single month she's getting that interest, that sweet, sweet 2% interest, which is really high for a savings account, right? She ends up with $365,000, which is great. It's $125,000 more than just saving it under your mattress, but it ain't really enough to retire on, right? If you're spending, for example, 50,000 a year, that gives you about seven years before you basically run out of money um, and you're not in retirement status and you're still not a millionaire or anything like that. So how does Amanda do? If she makes 10% per year instead of 2%, what does she end up with? Well, Amanda ends up with $2.9 million. It's a massive difference. That difference in rate over the course, of, you know, over these 40 years makes a massive difference, like, you know, seven or eight or nine times more money just for putting it into index funds versus a savings account, which is why we're all here. And so you might be saying, okay, sure, this is what happens when you put the numbers into an Excel spreadsheet. You just get this much, you know, steeper line. But what does real life look like? Well, this is the actual stock market over the last 40 years. You can see this line, it's not a smooth line, it's actually the stock market. So you can see right here, this is the, uh, the dot-com crash. This is the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Um, right here right at the end is actually the co coronavirus crash and today we're actually above that. And so if Amanda was not getting this imaginary 10% return, but she was actually putting her uh, money into the stock market, she would have actually ended up with $3.3 .3 million. So it's actually a little bit over 10% for the last 40 years, okay? So why is it, you know, why is this 10% difference versus this 10% return versus 2% return? Like, how does that work? Why is it such a massive difference? Where do these millions of dollars come from? So right now, I'm going to explain to you the chart that's going to change your life. I remember seeing this chart for the first time. It changed my life. Maybe it'll change your life too. The chart that'll change your life. Here it comes. This is investing $500 per month and earning a 10% return. Let me go back to the slides. So in year number one, you save $6,000, okay? So 500 bucks per month times 12 months is $6,000. That's where that 6,000 comes from. And if you get a 10% return, 10% of $6,000 is 600. So for the sake of this table here, we're just gonna assume that the money is like happens on a yearly basis instead of a monthly basis. So the math is a little simpler, but monthly is virtually the same thing. So you can see this 600 is 10% of this. So at the end of the year, you get how much money you put in, plus the 10% growth equals 6,600. You know, not bad, 6,600 bucks a month, or 6,600 bucks is a chunk of change. And that $600 of growth can buy you like half an iPhone or something. It's not life-changing money, but it's like, you know, it's a good start. Okay, but let's see what happens in year number two. In year number two, you save $6,000. But something very interesting happens because you get interest again, you get growth again, from the previous year's contributions because this money is still invested, still there in your investments. You haven't taken it out yet. So you get a 10% return on that. So that's 600 bucks from last year's contributions 
you get 600 bucks from this year's contributions. So that equals 1200 bucks. So you can see the growth is about 1200, but it's not 1200, it's 1260. So where's that 60 bucks from? Where does that 60 bucks come from? Well, that's 10% of the growth from last year. So last year you put this money in, you get paid from the money you put in last year, and then you get paid from the growth from last year too. So that money that you made for free last year makes you more money this year. That is the essence of compound growth. It's like you put the money in, it grows, and then the growth turns into more growth. And so you can then see at year number two, you have 13,860. Just two years in at 500 bucks a month, 13,000 bucks is a lot of money. Like, you know, even for me, who's a millionaire, that's a lot of money. Okay, now we're going to fast forward to year number 10. Year number 10, you put in that same $6,000, but you can imagine there's like, you know, 10 years here. So you're getting paid again, 10% of interest on every single one of the years. Plus you can pay 10% interest on every single one of the year's growth. So now you're making $9,000 per year in growth. You're actually making more money from the growth than you are from the savings. Just 10 years in, it's literally growing faster than your savings. So now the saving isn't even the most important uh, component now. The growth is a bigger component. And you're, you have $100,000 in just 10 years. And then if we fast forward to 40 years, wait, I need to move my, my little guy here for dramatic effect. After 40 years, it's $2.9 million. That's where it gets crazy, right? And look at this. Your growth in year number 40 is $265,000 of growth in a year. And this isn't for a job. This isn't a high-paying lawyer job or a doctor. This is just your $500 a month snowballing over time and then having this massive growth after the long period of time. So you have invested $240,000. That's what your 500 bucks a month is over the course of time. That's the under the mattress amount, remember? But your final investment is over 10 times that $2.9 million. How cool. That is the magic of a compound growth. All of your previous year's contributions plus all of your previous year's growth continuing to like fuel this fire. So this is a this is a picture of that exact same chart, the exact same numbers. So you can see it's kind of hard to see here because the numbers are so small relatively. But in year number 10, most of the money is green. So this green here is what you put in. Most of the money is what you actually put in. So in the early years, most of your wealth creation is just from the savings. Just necessarily, you have to get the ball rolling by putting money in. So in year number 10, most of your wealth is what you actually put in. So if you think about in year number 10, we had $100,000. $60,000 of that you put in, right? So 60%. But in year number 40, this red is the growth of what you put in. And then the blue is the growth of the growth. This blue here, remember that 60 bucks from that first year? This blue, that 60 bucks is what snowballs into most of your money. It's amazing. And so this is the importance. That's why rule number two of investing is to invest early and often. You want to keep throwing your money in to get that snowball going, to get this compound growth exploding. Okay, let's continue. So here is the first poll question. Oh, by the way, we're at 1,899 uh, attendees. We might hit that 2,000, but it's looking like it's slowing down right now, so that's good. But all right, so now I'm gonna ask you a poll question. How confident do you feel about this? Let's see if I can get polls to work. So when I mean how confident do you feel about this, um, I'm asking how confident do you feel about implementing what I just showed you? The concept of compound growth can turn into these massive results do you know what to do? Like, do you know what website to go to, what buttons to click, like what investments to choose? Um, thank you for all your answers. So we have, it's actually kind of a nice little curve with most people answering in the middle, three a little bit. Uh, we have we have 25% who are actually very confident, which is awesome. So I'm, you know, it kind of makes sense because there are, you know, financial enthusiasts who probably follow me and want to, you know, strengthen their understanding even further. Um, but yeah, most people are, so I'm going to end this poll now and move on. So most people, and I think you guys can see it. So most people have answered a little bit. 31% have answered a little bit. And that's typical. So I'm hoping by the end of this hour, you're going to be a four or a five um, because we're going to get into it right now. So great. So how do you do it? So that's just, I just showed you this 500 bucks turned into 2.9 million. How do you actually do this? Well, the short answer is by investing in the stock market. The stock market represents ownership in the companies of the world, the companies that we all go and work for every single day. You know, when we go to work and we do marketing or we're a doctor or we do sales or we're engineers or whatever, we make money for those companies and those companies profit. But if you want to like realize the gains of those companies as an owner, you can buy stock in those companies. And this chart here is showing you the stock market. And so you can see this red line is the constant 10% return 
that 10% we gave in the example of the compound growth. And then you can see the, the blue line is the actual growth of $100 in the S&P 500. So you can see if you put $100 back in 1920, you'd have you know close to $2 million today. Um, of course, none of us were alive in 1920, I don't think. No, probably not. Probably no 101-year-olds. Um, and if you were a 101-year-old watching and you invested $100 as a, a newborn child in 1920, uh, congratulations. I don't really have any advice for you. you. You've killed it. You've deserved your long life. Um, let's let's uh, let's spread this chart out a little bit. So this is the exact same data in uh, a logarithmic chart. So it's the exact same data, but you can see instead of that that uh, exponential curve, it's a straight line because this is a logarithmic chart, which means it goes from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000, 100,000 over here, which means a 10% drop back in like the 30s looks the same as a 10% drop in the, you know, the 90s or whatever, the 2000s. And so you can see the Great Depression was pretty ugly. Black Monday here is in 1987 where people were reportedly like throwing themselves out of, off of buildings because the market dropped 30% in one day. This is the dot-com crash, the financial crisis. And that little baby right there is our is our 30% crash from last year uh, during the coronavirus crash. And so you can see it's a it's a rough line, right? It's not smooth. If you ran your finger over it, it wouldn't be smooth, but it kind of sticks uh, pretty close to that 10% line. And if you pick any two spots on this line, if you pick any two spots on the screen line, it's constantly marching up. And so these little downturns make big headline news because they're unusual. You know, this one obviously was the worst, but you know, like this one last year made big news. Of course, we always talk about the financial crisis, the dot-com crash, Black Monday in 87. They make big news, but when they're, when it's not the news, the market is constantly marching up because the market represents ownership in all the com companies in the US and the world that are constantly plowing profits back to the owners. So it's constantly going up. And then when it goes down a little bit, we all freak out, but the market goes up. Okay, so owning stocks is how you realize this compound growth. And so then the next question is, okay, so which stocks do you buy? And so you can see this little thoughtful emoji is going, um, should I buy Netflix or Microsoft or Nike or Amazon or Google or Beyond Meat or whatever? And so I'm going to, ooh, I forgot to reset this poll, but whatever, you guys can probably not look at that. So now I'm going to ask the next question. The next poll question is, here's the quick poll. Uh, moving forward, which do you think is the best individual stock to buy? So in your opinion, which is the best stock to like guarantee you the highest rate of growth? Is it, oh man, I haven't published this yet, sorry. Which is the best stock to buy? Is it Apple? Sorry, this is actually our first time using Webinar Jam and we did practice a lot, but you know, I'm still not perfect and that's okay. So is it Apple? Is it Google? Is it Tesla? Is it Amazon? Is it another company other than those four or do you not know? And this is the, this is the company, the individual company you think is gonna guarantee you the highest rate of return among all companies. Great job answering these poll questions, guys. Very engaged. I'm loving it. Uh, okay, and so actually, I don't know, squeaked out a win at 25%. 23% uh, was Amazon. Apple was next at 16%. Uh, Tesla, 12, another company. And Google got no love, man. Google, 10%. Okay, well, I'll tell you what the correct answer is. The correct answer is, I don't know. If I knew what the best stock would be to buy, I would be a much more wealthy person than I am because I could trade on information and make infinite amount of money. Um, I would be cautious of any person or organization who tells you that they know what is the next best stock to buy because they don't know either or else they would be a multi-billionaire because they could trade on information and make unlimited amounts of money. The truth is we don't know. And I'll tell you why we don't know. We don't know because the market is efficient. The stock market is efficient. What that means is the sum total of public human knowledge is constantly and instantly being priced into every stock in the market. I'm going to close this poll now before I forget. So what that means is, let's say you're someone who voted for Amazon, which was the winner there, right? And you said, okay, I buy Amazon. I know Amazon's doing great. I know Amazon's selling a lot. I know it's going to sell a ton, so it must be the best stock. But the problem is everybody else knows that too. And so when you buy a share of Amazon stock, you're buying it from someone who also knows how great Amazon is. And they think that price has gotten a bit up so high that Amazon can't possibly meet those like lofty expectations. And going forward, the stock's going to slightly underperform. doesn't mean the stock's going to lose money necessarily, but it means it's not going to perform as well as everybody else thinks it is. And I'll give you an example. This is what you're up against. I'm going to have a drink. If you're worried about what's in this cup, don't worry, it's just gin. So what you're up against, let's say you want to buy a share of Tesla. Okay. And so you're like Tesla, way of the future. Actually, if you saw my Instagram stories, I rented a Tesla extremely nice cars. It's probably my next car, but 
I can't really rationalize buying one because I don't need a new car. So there are these companies that hire teams of analysts who went to Harvard and Yale, and they pay these analysts to go interview the former executives and CEOs of you know companies like Tesla to ask them questions about you know what you know the competitive landscape and what the culture is like inside Tesla and what's the morale and like all these things that you could never have access to unless you go interview those people and they don't do you know insider trading because that's illegal they're very careful not to but they do try to like get every single piece of public information that they can and using that information they decide the the answer to exactly one question is Tesla going to outperform the market going forward if it's going to go up more than the rest of the stocks they buy it. If it's not going to go up more than the rest of stocks, then they don't buy it or they sell it, right? And so they're just trying to answer that one question. You know, we can't have as much info as these analysts, but those those analysts are trading Tesla stock, right? There are also these companies who literally put satellites into space. And then those satellites take pictures of planet Earth, focusing on Tesla factories, counting the cars that come off the Tesla factory line technically public information because you can see it from public space. And they use that information to answer the question of, is Tesla going to outperform or underperform the uh, expectations for the next quarter? By the way, we're at 1993. I'm not sure if some people are getting kicked out of the uh, webinar at this point, but if they are, congrats to you for being here on time. Um, so those satellite companies are literally trying to figure out what's gonna happen. And you know what, see these, see, see these two little ropes here? The satellite research companies and the analyst companies, they're in this tug of war trying to decide what a share of Tesla stock is worth, right? So maybe the analysts decide to buy because they saw really good morale coming from inside the company, but the satellite research companies decide to sell because they saw that there are too few cars coming at the line, so the price, so the price is going to drop next quarter, right? But wait, there's more. There is algorithmic trading companies. These are companies who hire. So I have a master's in computer science. I have friends and colleagues who have PhDs in computer science. They get hired by the, these algorithmic trading companies who hire these PhDs to write programs to crunch massive amounts of data to figure out, is Tesla going to outperform yes or no over the next quarter? And these companies actually compete for real estate like a quarter of a mile closer to the trading servers because like a thousandth of a second makes a big deal to these trading companies, right? So, you know, they're trying to compete with each other, plus these other players, you know, they're trying to compete with each other, plus the analysts, plus the salary research companies to answer the question, is Tesla going to outperform? And there's one more player in this tug of war and it's you. So if you go to Robinhood and you buy a share of Tesla stock, it might very well be the case you're on the wrong side of a trade against these three guys who know more than you do. So when I say that market is efficient, it's because all of this information is constantly and instantly being priced into the market. So, and that's what sets the price of one share of Tesla stock, right? So that's why it's very hard to know. That's why I think the correct answer to that last question was, I don't know. We don't know what the next best stock is because they're all priced efficiently based on the sum total of human knowledge. That was my rant. Okay. Uh, ooh, we're at 2001. We officially hit capacity. Uh, maybe they let one more person in or maybe on that one. I don't know. But congratulations, Vivi. We need to upgrade our subscription. Apologies to those who couldn't get in. Uh, but congratulations to you guys. Uh, but if you are watching this, then we are sending out the replay after this, so you can you can rewatch this. And then the people who couldn't get in, they can watch it uh, at their own leisure. Okay. Um, so interim mutual fund. So since we can't know which stock to buy, Enter a mutual fund. Maybe you have heard of that term. Maybe you know what it is. So mutual fund, I'm in front of one of these emojis. Let me go back over here. Uh, da, 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 da. So a mutual fund is when, when a bunch of people mutually put their money, money into a fund. That's what a mutual fund is. It's like a very generic term. It can, it can do a lot of different things, but at its core, it just means a bunch of different people, like all these little emojis here, take all their money and they put it into a shared fund, mutual fund. Get it? Um, and then there is a manager. And so this, this little emoji here is a manager. And this manager does the hard work of picking stocks for the emojis there. So this manager has said, okay, there we'll buy Apple and Amazon. And you can see these like broccoli and uh, avocado and carrot emojis. Those are actually examples from the full course, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end, um, which like we like is more like uh, interactive, like you kind of help do the work. Uh, but yeah, so this manager chooses what stocks to go in the fund. And then the profits from those stocks go back to the emojis. And so this is basically an improvement over individual stock picking because these expert managers whose career it is to pick stocks for you, um, you know, 
take all the stocks and, and give the money back to you, basically saving you the time from having to do all that work and look at, you know, earnings ratios and, you know, whatever. Um, but there's a problem, of course. These managers charge a high fee for their service, right? So for all that work they do to like, you know, rent an apartment in Manhattan or not rent an office in Manhattan or Chicago and hire a team of analysts and, and buy a bunch of computers and all that stuff. Like they have to charge a bunch of money. So everyone puts their money in the managers take their share out win or lose. And then the remaining growth is returned back to the investors. Why is that a problem? Well, let's look at the impact of those fees. So you can see this green line here is that same example from the beginning where 500 bucks a month turns into 2.9 million. If you get a 10% rate of return, you get this 2.9 million. But what we just looked at was what's called an actively managed mutual fund because there's an active manager and that manager who's picking and choosing stocks for you. Let's say they charge a 2% fee, which is on the high end, but it's not unheard of. There are even higher you know, fee funds for sure. Let's say it's a 2% fee. So that means every year of all the money in the fund, they take out 2%, they leave a 98% to buy stocks with Let It Grow and then return the growth of that 98% to the investors. Um, but look at the difference it makes over the course of 40 years. It turns your 2.9 million into 1.6 million. So just that 2% fee per year reduces the final value in your investment by over 42% over the course of a career, which is devastating. And it gets worse because those managers are also competing in the efficient market. Study after study after study shows that we can't, you can't, uh, predictably choose a manager who's going to outperform the market. And so on average, by investing in an actively managed mutual fund, you're going to underperform the stock market by their fees. That's the, that's the result. Okay. So what do you do? Well, spoiler, this is like that part in the movie where they say the title of the movie. It's index fund time. What is an index fund? Well, an index fund is actually a type of mutual fund. It's one of a bunch of emojis or, you know, investors, human people like you, I assume, unless you're like a golden retriever watching because you want to get started investing, in which case, like, good boy. Who's a good boy? You are. Uh, I got distracted there for a minute. So what's an index fund? It's a type of mutual fund. It's where these emojis of people's or golden retrievers take their money, put it into a fund, and then uh, that money is invested. But this time, there's no manager. Instead, the index fund simply buys every single stock. So instead of picking stocks, an index fund buys every single stock in an index. And an index is simply a list of stocks. So for example, an S&P 500 index fund would be this. So this is the list of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. And so an S&P 500 index fund would have these 10 stocks, which are the 10 biggest stocks in the S&P 500, plus 490 more. And so instead of a manager picking and choosing which are the good stocks, an S&P 500 index fund simply picks every single stock in the S&P 500. The fees are extremely low. So instead of a 2% fee or a 1% fee, which is about average for an actively managed mutual fund, index funds have fees that are closer to 0.1% or lower. And in fact, Fidelity has even offered some 0% expense ratio uh, index funds where they don't charge you at all. They just simply let you buy all the stocks in one convenient package without any fee. And then of course the money is returned the, to the investor. So you can see, remember when we saw the impact of those fees, how it reduced your, your growth by 42%. When you buy an index fund, you eliminate most or all of those fees and thus, you know, maintain all the growth for your own pocket, which is the goal. Okay. So that's what an index fund is. Index funds have ticker symbols. So if you've ever bought or sold a stock, you know stocks have ticker symbols. So if you want to buy Apple, AAPL, that's a ticker symbol. AAPL. Why is it AAPL, not APPL? I don't know. Ask uh, Steve Jobs or Tim Cook. Um, but Steve Jobs is dead, so you'd better have a better chance with Tim Cook. But to be fair, Tim Cook is also not going to respond to email. So you just have to, I don't know, Google it. So you can see each of these three index funds are from three different brokerages, Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab. And then these are the ticker symbols. They all, all three of these are total US stock market index funds. So if you want to invest in the total US stock market, you could buy one, in any one of these and they all would perform functionally identically. They only differ in which, you know, which company provides it to you. And it doesn't really matter which one you pick. One's not gonna make you more rich than the other. You can see all their expense ratios are incredibly low. You know, all these I would say are like a rounding error different from each other. So I don't really think one is much better than the other. And when you compare this to 1%, it's dramatically lower. 
the difference between 0.04 and 0.015 is like rounding error. And you can see they all have about 3,000 stocks. Vanguard has a little bit more, but the difference in the number of stocks also doesn't matter because they all own like the biggest 500 stocks. They all own like the biggest 3,000 stocks. And the little tiny stocks like differ at the end doesn't really matter. So that is a U.S. index fund. So then the next question is, okay, so which index fund? That was an example of U.S. index funds. Should you buy one of those three? Well, it turns out there's basically a very simple way to have a very diverse, complete investment portfolio. It's called the three fund portfolio. It's by buying exactly three things. I learned I can do this with my webcam where I put numbers really close and it kind of has this dramatic, if that's giving you some sort of vertigo or something, I apologize. But it has three things. Number one is U.S. stocks, which is what, what, I, what I just showed you, the total U.S. stock market. Number two is international stocks. That means non-U.S. If you are not from the U.S., I apologize for this U.S.-centric view of the world. Uh, I assume you have to deal with that like all the time in your life, but uh, that's the world that at least I live in. Um, but you know, you guys can access these types of funds too. And then the third one is bonds. And so this is called a three-fund portfolio where you have U.S. stocks, international stocks, and bonds. So if we look at that a little bit deeper or an example of three-fund portfolio, it looks like this. So this would be would be considered an aggressive three-fund portfolio. Why is it aggressive? Because 90% uh, of, the, of the fund or the, of this portfolio is stock. You know, stocks are considered more aggressive than bonds because they're more volatile, but they generally go up faster over long periods of time. Bonds are safer. They're not as volatile and they produce income and kind of maintain their value. And so, and having a mix of those three, having a mix of these three things kind of has like a nice mix to, uh, for your whole portfolio. And so you can see, uh, this is 90% stocks. This would be an appropriate, like, this could be an appropriate asset allocation for a young person between, you know, like 20 and 40 or 20 and 45 or something. If you're like 65 and above, you would probably want a lot more bonds and a lot fewer stocks. So you don't see your life's work go away during the next COVID crash or whatever. So you can see, uh, you guys can see that, I think, right? I'll move just in case. So you can see these, this is three different examples of a three fund portfolio. So if you had a had an account with Vanguard, you could buy these three funds in these amounts. So for example, if you were putting a thousand bucks a month in here, you'd put 540 bucks in VTSAX, 360 bucks in VTIAX, and hundred bucks in VBTLX, Fidelity, Schwab. You can see this one is ETFs. These two are the mutual fund version of index funds. We go into the difference in the court in the full course, by the way. Again, I'm trying to cram as much into this in an hour. We're 32 minutes in. We're doing great. Uh, so this is a three-fund portfolio. And by the way, if you went to one of these brokerages' websites, opened an account, bought these three things for the brokerage of that you open it with. And by the way, it's usually best to match. It's almost always best to match the brokerage with the fund. So if you open a Vanguard account, you buy Vanguard funds. If you open up a Fidelity account, you buy Fidelity funds. You can mix them, but you usually charge high fees which we're trying to avoid, right? So if you did that and nothing but that for the rest of your career, you would be fabulously successful investor. You would outperform 95% of other investors who are making mistakes by choosing high fee funds or switching strategies or getting in and out of the market, things like that. Um, but is there an easier way? Well, PowerPoint presentation, I'm glad you asked because yes, there is. It's called a target date index fund. And so remember, this is our US stock index fund. There it is representing 55%. This is our international stock index fund that has, you know, this, uh, this U U.S. index fund has thousands of uh, U.S. stocks. The international index fund has thousands of international stocks. And then the bond index fund has thousands of bonds. So this is your three-fund portfolio. But our friendly friends, our friendly neighbors over at the financial services industry said, hey, let's make it even easier. We'll put all three of these into a single convenient package called a target date index fund. So then you only need to buy one thing. And inside that one thing, it contains all of the other things, right? So then you have to buy one thing and they're named after a year that is your target retirement age. And so remember how I mentioned, if you're young, you want mostly stocks. And if you're older, you want more bonds. The target, um, the target retirement is not a target retirement age, but the target retirement date. The target retirement date is based on your traditional retirement date, basically your age or your birth year plus 65 so that it's going to automatically contain the right mix of these for you. So it looks like this. It has this glide path. So you can see target date index funds are funds of funds that are designed to be all in one fully diversified investments. Um, so you can see in the early years, the colors have changed here, but you can see in the early years, it's US stock 
and international stock are these two colors. So it's 90% stock for the first 25 years of your investing career. And then it starts this very slow march. It looks like kind of a steep curve, but it's only like, you know, 1% a year or something. It's really changing. And then by your retirement age down here, after another 25 years, you're at about 50% uh, stocks, 50% bonds. And then even after the retirement age, it keeps uh, transitioning so that when you were like in your 80s, for example, in your 80s, you're not really looking for 20 year growth. I mean, you know, actually 80 year olds might live 10 years, which is why there's some stocks, you know, they might live 20 years too. Um, but what you're really looking for when you're like in your golden years and you're looking to live, you're living, looking for income and stability and, um, and uh, capital preservation so that you don't lose your money. And that's what all this blue stuff is. So you can see it's like a nice march towards like really aggressive when you're young, where you don't care if it's like going up and down. Then when you're old, hey, take some of your chips off the table, let those work for you in the terms of bonds. So that's what a target date index fund does. Um, target, date index fund, target date index funds have ticker symbols. So you can see this whole table here is a whole bunch of ticker symbols for targeted index funds. So for example, a 28 year old with a Vanguard account was, would, be, would have been born in 1992 plus 65 is 2057. So this is a 28 year old's target retirement year, which means their uh, target retirement age would be closest to this VFFVX. So if you are a 28 year old and you have a Vanguard account, you can put VFFVX in, as your investment, and that can be the one and only investment you buy for the rest of your living days, and you will outperform like 95% or more of investors. It sounds crazy, but it really can be that simple if you cut through all the noise. And the noise is usually you know, salesmen and people who don't have your best interest at heart trying to get you to do something more complicated so that they can make more money. But this right here is the simple low fee optimal path. Um, okay, so that's what index fund is. This is why you want to, you know, the the compound growth, the stock market, the optimal, um, the opt or the uh, efficient market, the three fund portfolio. We we got to a target index fund, which I think is like the most simple and efficient and optimal way to invest. So where do index funds live? Um, they actually have to go somewhere. They can't go in your checking account, for example, because checking accounts only hold cash. So there's this new type of account. I need to move myself again. So you're familiar with a checking account, which holds only cash and you can write checks and doesn't really pay interest or a savings account, which holds only cash and pays higher interest. But there's a new type of account called a brokerage account. Brokerage accounts can hold cash, but also stocks like Apple or bonds or ETFs. We also go into bonds in the course, by the way, ETFs, mutual funds, and then investments gain or lose value and pay dividends. And so basically when you start investing, you need to open up a new type of account called a brokerage account. And then that account, inside of that account is where you put your index funds. So you'd have like a checking account with your cash where you pay your bills and you have a brokerage account with your index funds that go up in value. But wait, life isn't quite that simple um, because there's yet another type of account. It's called an IRA. And so an IRA is a special type of brokerage account. You've probably heard of the term Roth IRA or traditional IRA. And so an IRA is an account, just like a checking account or a savings account, and you invest inside, it's a brokerage account. But the government, the US government, by the way, if you are uh, not a US citizen, this does not apply to you whatsoever. You know, if you're not paying taxes in the US, this doesn't apply to you, this is like US tax law. And a lot of people ask me like, does this work for non-US citizens? And the answer is everything here works no matter where you are, but this tax and account stuff is basically US specific, sorry. I live in the US, most of my followers do too. So that's why we talk about it. So the Roth IRA is a special type of brokerage account where when you put money in and then you buy an investment inside of your Roth IRA, it can grow and you never pay tax on it again. And the government has basically made these special rules to encourage people to invest. There are some, there's limits, like you can't put more than $6,000 per in. You, you may not be able to invest or you may not be able to contribute at all if you make over a certain amount of money. We go into these details a lot more in the course, but basically it's a different type of brokerage account that offers tax breaks, okay? So that's what a Roth IRA is. It's just a brokerage account. Index funds go inside of both of these things. You can see the little cash emojis are going and checking savings. And then your Roth IRA and your brokerage account have all these different emojis, or these different emojis. Okay, and so right now you might be thinking, Jeremy, you probably should have put so much gin in that cup because that, that's crazy talk, that made no sense. So I think this chart 
may help clarify a little bit because you might be thinking something like, wait a minute, weren't we just talking about index funds? What's better, a Roth IRA or an index fund? Or you're like, where do 401ks fit into this mess? Or what's a Vanguard? Um, so hopefully this little chart helps clear it up. At the core of investing, I think I put this over on the left so I can have room over on the right. At the core of investing is the stocks and bonds. That's what makes money. Owning a share of the companies and the bonds that produce income, owning those things are what goes up in value. That's like why we do all this, right? But stocks and bonds, but like we talked about, buying individual stocks and bonds is difficult, complicated, and not efficient, all that bad stuff. So stocks and bonds go inside of a fund, like an index fund, an ETF, or a mutual fund. So instead of buying a stock or bond directly, you buy the index fund and that holds all the stocks. So stocks go to index fund. But index funds don't just live out there in the vacuum. They have to go somewhere too. Those go inside of an account. So like an IRA. So if you have a Roth IRA, you open it like it's an account, you buy an index fund and inside of the index fund is the stocks and the bonds. So that is the, like, that's what I mean by the layers of investing. Each of these things goes inside the other. You open up an IRA, you buy an index fund and it holds the stocks. But the IRA has to be on a website or whatever. So enter the brokerage. And that's like Vanguard, Fidelity, or Schwab, or Robinhood, or Betterment, or eToro, or Interactive Brokers, or M1, or there's dozens of these, bro these brokerages. These brokerages are just basically companies who allow you to open an account and then sell you an index fund, which has the stocks and bonds. Okay? So if you're saying, hey, What's better, an IRA or an index fund? Uh, the answer is that doesn't make any sense because those things aren't comparable. They're in two different layers. The index fund goes in the IRA. You need both to invest. So I think we have a pop quiz. We do. Here it is, the pop quiz. If you were sleeping during that last section, apologies. Um, here it is. Which of these terms is in a different layer from the other? So index fund, 401k, brokerage account, Roth IRA, which of these things is not like the other? Cheers, everybody. It's after five in San Diego, where I am. It's not really gin, guys. It's water. Calm down. You can, you can save your DMs on that one. Actually, no one DMs me about drinking. They probably prefer I do. Uh, all right. I'm ending the poll. So, there's a correct answer to this one. This wasn't a survey. This was actually a quiz. The correct answer most of you got is index fund because 401k, brokerage account, and Roth IRA all belong in the account level. IRA, 401k, brokerage account. These are all the same. Those are all accounts. An index fund can go inside of each of those other things. So an index, index fund goes inside of an IRA. An index fund goes inside of a 401k. An index fund goes inside of a brokerage account. So congratulations to 57% of you the 43% of you, that's okay. That's why we're here to learn. That's how you get better by making mistakes and improving. Okay, so maybe you've seen this on my Instagram before. This is basically the post-it note version of everything that we've covered for the last 43 minutes, the ultimate investing checklist. So it says, first, invest in these accounts. So you invest in your 401k and in, in this order, and then this, these little parentheses are how much money you can put in each of those accounts. So you invest in your 401k up to your match, your HSA, your Roth IRA, you go back to your 401k up to the government limit, and then you can put an unlimited amount in the regular old brokerage account. So that's where you put your money. Then once the money is in there, you choose one to five low cost index funds. My personal favorite way is to just choose one, a target date index fund, but you could do a three fund portfolio, or you could even add some like small cap or some real estate or something like that, which I don't actually think is like a great idea, but it's not a terrible idea either. And you can do whatever you want because it's your money and I'm not selling these things. I'm just informing you of what my opinion is. Um, then you turn on dividend reinvestment, which we haven't talked about, but it means when those funds pay you cash just for owning them, you buy more of the same thing we talk about in the course. You set up automatic investments, haven't talked about it, but it's just what it sounds like. Rebalance on a fixed schedule, haven't talked about it. It's in the course, it's not a big deal reallocate towards bonds as you age. We did talk about that. And then don't sell anything until you retire. That's kind of an important one because a lot of people ask, hey, there's a crash coming up. Should I get it out? Should I wait to get in? The answer to all those questions about timing the market is don't time the market. Put your money in early and often and literally don't sell a single thing until you retire. Then when you do retire, you just take out what you need and then you have solved investing forever. Okay, there we have it. Um, so now we're on to what buttons to click. And our timing is doing great. So up until this point, it's been 
fairly abstract. There have been emojis, there have been pie charts, there have been uh, graphs that are animated. Um, and so you might be saying, Jeremy, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know what you're saying. I already made the gin joke, so I'm not gonna make that one again. But you might be saying, I don't know what to do. Like, I literally, I'm like a hands-on person and I'm with you, like until I see it, I don't know what to do. So I'm literally gonna show you what buttons to click to do this. So we're gonna start with my old friend, Vanguard. So Vanguard is actually the company that kind of created slash popularized the index fund. My uh, personal investment hero, Jack Bogle, who so sadly died in 2019, was the founder of Vanguard and he created the index fund. And he basically looked at the efficient stock market and saw that the financial services industry was taking trillions of dollars a year out of the pockets of, of normal investors like you and me and putting it into their pockets and then giving us lower returns. And he said, hey, let's make an index fund where we don't have all those fees and then route the money directly from uh, the companies that grow to your own account, like a Roth IRA or 401k. And hence the index fund is born. And so Vanguard is the company that does it. And they also have a relatively altruistic business model, which means they don't have outside owners who are uh, incentivized to charge you high fees. The company Vanguard itself is owned by the funds you invest in so that if you, if they increase fees, that actually benefits you yourself. So that's why, by the way, I don't have any deal with Vanguard. Vanguard has never spoken to me. I wish they would. I really like them. Uh, I don't have a deal with any brokerage company. I just use Vanguard as an example because I think it's probably the most altruistic choice. But you could also use Fidelity, Schwab, Betterment, Wealthfront, M1. Robinhood's not my favorite. You know, whatever. E-Trade, TD. Okay, so here you go. You go to Vanguard.com. You click open an account. Remember how we need an account? Brokerage at the top level, account at the second level. Then you choose which type of account. You can see here, it might be a little hard to see for you guys, but it says Roth IRA here. So you choose Roth IRA, you click continue. This is gonna be recorded by the way, plus it's all in the course, plus it's on Instagram. Um, you link your bank account. So when you open up a Roth IRA, you need to put money into it somehow. So just like a Venmo, you link your bank account by putting your checking, your, your account number and routing number. Um, this is that thing I said about dividends where you reinvest those dividends. So when you get paid from the funds, it buys more of the funds to like maximize that compound growth. And then once your account's open, you see something like this. So this is my actual Vanguard account I'm gonna show you. So uh, if you wanna see, or you wanna like buy an index fund, what you do is you click my accounts, then you click buy and sell. So this is how you buy an index fund once you've opened your account. Then you click buy funds. And so you can see you invest in, uh, you can also like buy an individual stock or you can transfer money. But in this case, I want to click buy funds because I want to buy an index fund. Then you say, where's the money going? And so you have to, here you have to put in the ticker symbol of that thing you want. And so remember this little guy here. So if I'm choosing a targeted index fund, I look at my target retirement year, which is my birth year plus 65. And so in this case, uh, 2055, that's so I type in VFFVX. I type it in there and then it shows the target 2055 uh, index fund. There's the ticker symbol. Then you say, where's the money? Then it asks, where's the money coming from? It comes from, you can choose my settlement fund, which means cash already sitting in your account, or you can choose from one of your linked accounts, like saying, hey, pull money out of my checking account and put it into this fund. Um, you can choose your amount there, choose your checking account. And then this is what it looks like. So this is like an already invested Vanguard account. So again, remember the layers of investing. At the top, there's Vanguard. That is the website I go to to actually do the investing. Then I have a brokerage account. This isn't my Roth IRA. This is actually a regular old brokerage account, which can have an unlimited amount of money in it, but it doesn't have those same tax benefits a Roth IRA has. Then if I click to go inside of my brokerage account, I see my actual account. And so you can see inside of my brokerage account is the fund. So that's the third layer, remember? Brokerage, account, inside the account is fund. And so you can see there's my fund, VFIFX, which is in my case, 2050, because I was born in 1980. 1980 plus 65 is 2045. I decided to go with 2050 to keep my investments a little aggressive for longer because I plan to live a super long time. Um, so there it is. And then, so that remember, brokerage, fund, or sorry, brokerage account. So Vanguard, brokerage account, fund. And then inside of that fund is the actual stocks. So you can see if I click through to see what's inside of my targeted index fund, then I own Apple and Microsoft and Amazon and Google and Facebook and Tesla and Berkshire Hathaway, which is Warren Buffett's company, JP Morgan, Johnson Johnson, Visa. So you can see, and this is just 10, the 10 largest holdings, but actually holds many thousands of holdings. 
So by buying this one little innocent looking guy, I have thousands of stocks, thousands of bonds, and it's automatically rebalancing and reallocating towards bonds as I age. It's a beautiful, simple way to invest. I forgot to reset this poll. Resetting it now. Okay. So then since you, 19 or 191 people, again, apologize, people who can get in, are here, I'm gonna show you one very special thing, which is my own Fidelity account. This is my, this is like the voyeuristic time to look inside of someone else's bank account, which is super fun and interesting. Here it is. This is what it looks like. It's like that moment from a cooking show where they like do all this mixing and then they pull up the oven with like the one that's already done. This is what it looks like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years later. And you can see I have 2.8 million bucks in there, which is really great. And I said my net worth is about 4.5 million. This screenshot's a little bit old. I think it's about 3 million in there right now. Then I own the condo that you see behind me, which is worth about, you know, 900,000. So what, what are we up to? 3.9 million. Then the other 600,000, there's some in Vanguard, which I showed you. And then there's some in like real estate, not in my brokerage account, but most of the money's in here. And then you can see I have a brokerage account. I have a Roth IRA. I have a traditional IRA. I have a checking account. I have a 529, which is an, another account for investing for kids. Also in the course, a health savings account also in the course, and I have my credit card. So basically I have like basically one of every account, which is pretty typical. Then inside of all these is like some mix of cash, like in my checking account and index funds inside of my investment accounts. There you go, uh, a voyeuristic look inside of someone else's checking account or inside of someone else's investment account. Please do not hack me. Okay, so there we go, 51 minutes. I crammed as much in as I could. Do you wanna learn more? So I know I've teased a little bit um, about the uh, the course. I do have a course. I would love to, if I could just snap my fingers and like transfer everything that's in my brain to all people, except for like the really messed up stuff, I would do that. Um, and then I would just retire from this because it doesn't need to happen anymore. But I can't do that because the matrix doesn't exist. And so I have a full course that goes into all the stuff I could not fit in this hour. For example, learn how to project your future wealth. So today's Instagram post talked about how you don't need to retire when you're 65. You could retire when you're much younger. And so you can figure out how to like project when you're going to get there and when you can retire. Um, how stocks and bonds actually work. We didn't actually get into the nuts and bolts of that. Didn't have time. Um, how taxes work on investments and the different accounts. And we kind of like skimmed over that a little bit. But if you have a 401k or HSA, we go into that all in great depth. Um, how to set up those auto investments and reinvesting dividends. Didn't get into that. Um, rebalancing and lump sum versus dollar cost averaging. That's like a really common problem have, people have if they have a bunch of money. Do you put it all in once or do you spread it out? We go over that. Um, you can calculate when you're going to hit financial independence, retire early, fire. Investing for kids. If you have kids and you want to open up a 529 or save for college or just get them started off on the right foot, we cover that. We talk about with withdrawal strategies in potentially early retirement. So a lot of times I get a question of like about, hey, so you have all this money then what? Like, how do you get the money back out? We talk about, you know, where you pull it from, how you get the money out, et cetera. And then case studies of different situations, all of the above. So we basically say, okay, let's say you're 35. Let's say you're 25. Let's say you're 40. Um, let's say you've got these different types of income and accounts. Then we go through how it actually worked for that example. And I think you, you I think that's a really good way to like internalize or, you know, see how it would apply to your own personal situation. So the course has over seven hours of content. It's videos and quizzes taken at your own pace. I really like the quizzes because they are, they're not like the quiz I did today, which is maybe a bad example. They're learn by doing quizzes. And so actually have you basically try to figure stuff out on your own by doing this interactive learning stuff. And then the video comes after that where we talk about what you just did. I think a really effective way to learn. I uh, consulted with my PhD of education friend who said that is Pogel process oriented guided interactive learning. Um, and it's a really effective way to learn. And that's what we do in the course. Um, you have unlimited lifetime access. So it's a one-time fee. And then when you buy, you have it forever. I got a DM from someone the other day who said they bought it a few months ago. And then while I start now, and they're like really hoping they could still have access. And I was like, hey, good, good news. You have access forever. And we're actually, we're planning a big, um, we're going to like refilm all the, so I made the course at the beginning of this year. So at the beginning or beginning of next year, we're going to like kind of revamp the whole thing and make it even better. And you'll have access to that at the beginning of the new year. Um, it has crazy good reviews. So, you know, the, the reviews are literally blow my mind. And you can actually Google personal finance club reviews and you can see them publicly on Trustpilot. So I can't like remove the bad ones or anything. Um, but it really like changes people's lives and it's like amazing and it makes me super happy. Um, so these are, you know, 
I can never even do justice to the reviews. People are so kind in the reviews. And I just like, I feel like, you know, no one really reads other people's reviews, but like, I just, yeah, thankful for that. And uh, they're great reviews. Also, you get a hundred percent money back guarantee. So like, if you don't like the course for whatever reason, just email it, or just email us, me or Vivi, info at personalfinanceclub.com and we'll give you all your money back. So yeah, it says over here, we are, we're trying to make you rich, not sell you junk. Um, you know, we, we probably, you know, I think we've sold like 6,000 courses and we had like a dozen or so refund requests and we just happily say no problem. And actually when I did this, it was because I went to, I saw some other like stock picking course, which I don't believe in as you've learned. Um, and it was like $5,000 for this course. And then all over the purchase page, it was, it said, absolutely no refunds, never get your money back. Don't even ask, you never get your money back. I'm like, man, that is just like projecting lack of faith in this product. I'm like, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to say, get your money back whenever you want. Um, and that's fine. You know, if you, if you don't like it, then you'll get your money back. That's it. Um, it's also for a good cause. And so 20% of sales, not profits, 20% of the actual sales go to uh, charities that we believe in. And so we like, you know, we kind of change every month, but some of it goes to fill in the deepest need, like the ones that like have the biggest impact for a dollar, uh, biggest impact per dollar. And so we've donated over $95,000 since uh, we launched the course in October of last year. So it's been like 11 and a half months. And so I think after this sale, we're going to pass the hundred thousand dollar mark, which is like crazy to me. It's like so fun to be writing these like $20,000 checks to these charities. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and when I, I did this because when I created the course, I wanted it to be an engine for good. Like I believe the information is good and it's going to make people wealthy, but I also wanted it to like, you know, help people, you know, help people need in the moment. And also provide some revenue so we can hire people like BB to make personal finance club better. Uh, what else, what else is good news about this course? Oh yeah. So what does it cost? Well, it's not $5,000 like that other guy was charging. That's bananas. It's too much money. If I'm being honest with you, I was trying to maximize like this new little company's revenue of mine. I would probably charge a thousand dollars or nine ninety nine because a few fewer people would buy it, but we'd make a lot more money per sale and we would maximize our revenue, but that's still, still too much money too. Most courses like this cost two ninety seven or three hundred, or they make it a little bit less for some weird reason. I think that would be like a perfectly fair course. Like one of the most common like reviews we get is like it's worth way more than he charges. What's the actual price? Well, it's seventy nine dollars. Um, but I think you might have heard there's actually a sale starting supposed to be tomorrow, but since you came to the webinar, it's starting at this exact moment. It's actually now fifty nine bucks. So you can use this coupon code Build Wealth. It's good until Monday only. So four days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And then you get it for 59 bucks, unlimited lifetime access, 100% uh, money back guarantee, all future updates, all that good stuff. Um, it says click the button to get started, but I'm not going to show you the button yet because you may have won a free copy. So we're going to do that right now. Giveaway winners. End of show. Click to exit. So I'm going to try to hopefully pull open the giveaway winners here. Let's see. They look like they updated Vivi. Great job. Wait, don't look yet. It's a surprise. Okay, giveaway time. So let's make this big. If your name is called, you have 30 minutes to email us to redeem your prize to congratulate the 1927 of you to say it to the end. So here are the winners. Irvi K from San Francisco. Ramir West from Puerto Rico. Suchi S from Atlanta. Some... Samukha, Samukha, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Anne from Philadelphia, Adele M from Honolulu, Isabel R from Fort Lauderdale, Janet M from Wenatchee, Andrea P from Dallas, Talani, Talani O from Gainesville, and Megan W from San Diego. I literally think we need to maybe pick a new winner because I literally think that might be my girlfriend. Like I'm dating someone named Megan W from San Diego. Um, so if so, that's going to be, that was not planned. That was crazy. Maybe we'll, we'll give a new one out on, uh, on Instagram tomorrow. That's hilarious. So hi, Megan, by the way. Um, so those are winners. So if you are one of those people or if you're Megan W from San Diego, who I'm not currently dating, um, then email info at personalfinanceclub.com and you get the course for free. Congratulations. Uh, if you are, yeah, giveaway winners. There you go. Email us at 30 minutes, info, uh, info at personalfinanceclub.com. Um, and yeah, use the same email you used to sign for the webinar just so we know it's you, if you don't mind. Last time we did this, we gave every single one out. Um, so 
Before I do questions, I want to show you the button. So if you didn't win, I apologize. Can't believe Megan got picked. What a world. Um, but I'm sure this offer. So there's the button. So if you want to buy it, 59 bucks, it'll make you a millionaire of the course of your life. It'll save you tens or hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in fees. Um, it's a good course. It's good for a good cause. We're going to give away 20%. So there it is. You can click that get started button and check out right now. Um, the discount, use coupon code BUILDWEALTH at uh, checkout. And the coupon code is good until Monday. That said, let's answer, let's ask some questions. Someone said they'd take Megan's free course. Oh my gosh, I didn't put the button up. Uh, I forgot to do this. Sorry, publish. Okay, there's the button. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, Vivi, for telling me the button was there. Like I said, first time using. Okay, so it's six o'clock. I would love for every single person to go click that button and give me $59 right now. If you don't want to do it, that's great too. Save your money and invest it. If you want to stick around, I'm going to stick around for 10 more minutes, maybe 15 and answer questions. But this is the official end of the webinar because I want to respect your time for everyone who allotted one hour of time for the webinar. Um, you can feel free to, of course, you can leave whenever you want because you know, you're know you not captive here. But yeah, at the end of the planned content, but I am going to try to answer some questions over the next 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, there is the offer if you want to click the button and go by the course and learn all that exciting stuff. I can't believe that Megan won the prize. Um, let's see. Katie Heidman asked a great question. Can you lose all your money by investing in index funds? That's a really good question. It's a really common question because there is this idea out there that investing is very risky. And I feel like a lot of parents say, oh, the stock market's just, it's just gambling. It's just, you know, it's just the wild wet or, you know, it's just like going to Vegas, whatever. So here's the thing. When you buy an index fund, you are buying a share of every single company in the stock market. For you to lose all your money in an index fund, what that means is that every single company in the stock market would have to no longer be operating. That means well, every Walmart has shut their doors. Amazon has turned off their website. Uh, FedEx does not exist. Exxon Mobil is not selling gas. Uh, you know, Google, you cannot Google anything because Google has shut their doors. Every single company has to go to zero. Every single, single company has to go out of business. If that happens, I don't know if that's going to happen because I can't see the future. Like maybe an asteroid hits the world tomorrow and then we all lose all our money or whatever. But like if that happens, here's the thing. The money in your checking account is also no longer good. Like if that happens and somehow we're still alive, we are no longer living in a stable economy. There's probably no government. There's no trade. There's no market. Like we're literally in like a, you know, Mad Max Wild West thing. And so, so the point, like, again, like, you know, I'm not saying it's going to happen. The point is you are no worse off for um, investing in index fund. Index funds have never gone to zero you know, they can't go to zero, right? The, the world still exists. So the answer is no, you can't lose all your money by investing in things. There are ways to invest in which you can lose all your money. So if you heard of like options trading where you're like betting if a stock's gonna go up, you can you can bet on whether a stock's gonna go up. And then if you get that bet wrong, you can lose all your money. But that's not what we're doing. We're building wealth by slowly accumulating more and more shares of the total economy. And as that economy grows and profits, it comes back to us and we build wealth. That's why investing in the next funds is good. Okay. What's the difference between a 403B and a Roth IRA? So this is from Taylor Chase. So those are both types of accounts. Checking account, savings account, Roth IRA, 403B. Those are both types of brokerage accounts. A 403B is simply a brokerage account that offers a tax break, but it's only offered through your employer. This is just like, and by the way, like, I don't like this part of personal finance. It's annoying to me. These are like government rules that I'm trying to explain and I can't rationalize the decisions made by our Congress or whatever, but that's the world we live in. And so I'm answering the question. A 403B is basically the government has said, hey, if you are a nonprofit or a school or a hospital or a government or some like, you know, some, some sort of organization like that, you can give your employees a 403B. So Taylor, the fact that you said 403B makes me guess you're working for one of those companies. In that case, you can put money into that account and you can buy index funds and you get a, can get a tax break. The difference between those two is one is offered by your company, one is offered by, um, or one is offered individually. 
Victoria said this was amazing. Thank you. That's not a question, but you were correct. It was amazing. Just kidding. Uh, I mean, I'm not kidding. I did believe it was amazing, but that would be really conceited of me to say out loud, so I won't. Um, Corey Craven said, I already maxed out my Roths, uh, so should I just open a traditional Roth and keep buying index fund? So um, that doesn't question doesn't quite make sense. A traditional Roth or opposite, you can have a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. I think what you probably meant is I've already maxed out my Roth IRA. Should I just open up a regular brokerage account and keep buying index funds? And the answer is yes. You know, remember if you looked when you looked at my um, brokerage account or my, you know, yeah, my all my brokerage accounts, like 95% of my own wealth is in a regular old brokerage account simply because I made my money too fast to fit into a Roth IRA. So most of my money went to brokerage account. And basically, once you start investing aggressively, you end up having maxed out all the tax break options. And then all the overflow money goes into a regular brokerage account, which is a good thing, a good problem to have. And it's also brokerage accounts are nice because they're really flexible. You can take the money out whenever you want, all that good stuff. Um, let me find another question. It's helpful when you guys put the little question sticker. Leslie Lee says, are you invested in any Vanguard ETFs? And if so, do you recommend any for new investors? And so um, I don't think I happen to own any Vanguard ETFs. I do own a Vanguard target date index fund. Uh, Vanguard ETFs are fantastic. I would certainly own them, um, but there's no real, you know, there's no real better. So if you're investing in a Vanguard total stock market ETF or Fidelity total stock market index fund or an iShares total stock market ETF or a Schwab total stock market ETF, they're all identical. Like the difference between them is pennies. And I don't know which one's going to end up with more pennies. It's like rounding error. And so, you know, the Vanguard ones are equally as fantastic as the rest. You know, maybe they have like a slight benefit because they are the altruistic version or whatever. Um, but, you know, the ones I recommend are that three fund portfolio. You know, you can't do a target date ETF that doesn't exist yet. So that's why I like the index fund or the mutual fund version of the target date funds. Um, but, you know, the, the three ETFs that make up a Vanguard ETF three fund portfolio are VTI, which is a total U.S. stock market, VXUS, which is a total international stock market, and uh, BND, which is a total bond market. So there's your three fund portfolio if you wrote that down quick enough. Melinda wrote thoughts on, oh, she made this private. So sorry, I called you out, Melinda. Melinda th said, wrote thoughts on robo-advisors like Betterment, Wealthfront versus Vanguard Philly. I like the robo-advisors. I think they're good. They buy index funds. They buy them in, you know, they're basically like another way to do a target date index fund. Um, you know, sometimes I think I should just close up shop and write like go to Betterment because uh, I think they're great. You know, the downside to those robo-advisors is like a few things. One, there's a fee. There's a 0.25% annual fee for the big ones that you mentioned. Uh, that's, you know, it's not as bad as one to 2%, but it's going to cost you probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars over the course of a career. Uh, you know, they might lack some flexibility, which I don't really see as a negative. I like that they don't give you enough rope to hang yourself with. Uh, but if people wanted to buy individual stocks, you can't do that through Betterment. And then the third negative that I might say is that they're just relatively new. And so, you know, and I think they're losing money right now. And so they might have an incentive to ramp up fees in the future. That's speculative, but they have a re relatively short track record. So we just don't really know what their long-term behavior is going to be like. But, you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate. I like them. I have friends that use Betterment. I tell them to keep up with it. Um, let's look for some more questions. How much did you invest when you first started out? So my personal story, I didn't go into it because I uh, wasn't trying to make this all about me, but I started when I was 17, putting away like a little bit of money for my summer jobs. During my 20s, it was just rough. I didn't have a lot of money. So I, like some years I put in $5,000, some years I didn't. And so then by the age of 34, I think I had $120,000 and I was making $36,000 a year. That's my max ever take home salary from my job, making $36,000. I had, I had grown my portfolio to $120,000. I was well on my way to being a millionaire as the compound growth continued to ramp up. Um, but then I sold an internet company that I was working on for the last 12 years for $5 million. My share after taxes was $2 million. So my net worth went from $0.1 million to $2.1 million overnight. Then I just dumped all that into index funds, which has since more than doubled, which is my, why my net worth is currently at $4.5 million. That's my life. That's my financial life story in a minute. Um, 
Michael Thomas II, what books would you recommend that have been helpful for your investing journey? I have a list on my website. If you go to, so you can see my website down here, personalfinanceclub.com. If you go to that website and there's a little search box on the top right and you type in books or reading list, um, it'll show you. If I had a name two, I'd say The Simple Path to Wealth by JL Collins and anything by Jack Bogle. Um, let's read some more questions. These are fun. It's been 10 minutes. I'll go five more and then we're done. Can I invest since this says, can I invest in the next funds if I'm not an American and don't live and don't have a bank account in the US? The answer is yes. Interactive Brokers is a brokerage that serves most countries in the world. Um, I don't know what country you live in and I don't know the intricacies of your country's tax code and the brokerages that serve your country. But yes, you can. But the bad news is it's not as nice as the US. In the US, we have, we're living in the like glory age of like low fee or no fee trading and investing with like hyper, you know, great, great brokerages and hyper competitiveness. Um, so yes, you can, but it's not as nice as it is in the US. Um, Alexander says, I heard that Roth maxes out at 6K per year. I think she means Roth IRA. If we have more money to put it, where we should put, where should we put it? Remember that checklist we saw? It lists five steps. 401k, HSA, Roth IRA, back to your 401k, and then your brokerage account. So those other accounts. And the catch-all is the brokerage account. And sometimes you don't have those other accounts. So you just put 6,000 into a Roth IRA, then everything else into a brokerage account. And that's perfectly fine. That's basically what I do. Erica G says, I'm 28 and I want to retire by 35. Very aggressive. Seven years. Amazing. I would love for you to do that. I'm going to hustle hard till then, eat ramen, et cetera. Is it doable to get to a point where you're living um, off your earnings in seven years? Seven years. So if you're starting from zero, Erica, that'd be extremely unlikely. Like we're talking, you'd have to, you'd have to save probably like 75% of your money. Um, and then you'd have to live on that same low, you know, that would get you only to like have enough to live on what you're currently living on. And so seven years is very aggressive. The number that I think is like attainable for people who really want to hustle and have high incomes is 15 years. If you're starting from zero and you save 50% of your take-home pay, you'll basically get there in 15 years. Erica G, if you want to be crazy and go over 50%, you can get that down. If you want to pick up side hustles, you want to like live further below your means, you want to get promotions at work, uh, whatever, you know, seven years starting from zero is just the math is nearly impossible. Um, I do have a calculator on my website that I love. Uh, so if you go to my website and click on tools and click on retirement calculator, you can put in your age, like 28, how much money you're saving. And it'll show you at what age you will hit financial independence. So Erica G, I would suggest checking out that calculator. Um, Chloe Lee says, can you move mutual funds and index funds? Well, that question doesn't quite make sense because index funds are a type of mutual fund. But I think what you might be saying is, I currently have high fee actively managed mutual funds. Can I trade those into low fee index funds? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, you know, it depends on the account, how you do it. If you're dealing with a financial advisor, you might have to tell them what you want to do and they're not going to like it because they don't make money on index funds. You might need to leave that financial advisor. If you have a 401k or 403b, you would need to choose different options that they give you. And if you have just like a Roth IRA or a brokerage account, which you handle through your own account, um, you would just go in and click trade and switch them out. So you definitely can do that. Uh, Derek asks, is there a better order to how to invest like IRA than index funds or vice versa? Yes. Look at the, so first, again, IRA, the index funds doesn't make sense because they're different levels of the um, layers. I, index funds go inside of the Roth IRA and then check that post note. We talk about that a lot in the course, by the way. So that's like a good uh, thing to look at that posted note. You can also search, it's called, it's called the ultimate investing checklist. If you want to go to my website and search for it. Alexis says, when people say hundred K is a magic net worth number, is that hundred K in investments only? Or if you have 80 K investments and 20 K in savings, um, I don't know what that means. I don't know what this magic net worth number is. I mean, I think maybe people say, that's hilarious. I said, Alexis, and then my Alexa started talking to me. <laughs> Uh, you should know your name. I'm not going to say her name or she's going to talk again. Um, so I think they say the first 100000 is the hardest. And I think that generally means investments, right? Because once you have $1,000 invested, then that compound growth starts to ramp up. But it's all, you know, it's all a spectrum. Like, you know, there's nothing magic about that exact number. Um, if you can't get the desired index fund in your brokerage, do ETFs actually achieve the same exact idea? That's from Mohammed. Yes. Yep. ETFs, index funds. 
the same exact underlying stocks. They only differ in how they trade. We have a whole section of that in the course. All right, I'm gonna do two more questions. Thank you for all the questions, by the way. So Guy asks, do you get charged a fee or have to pay tax if you withdraw your money from a targeted index fund before retirement age? And so the answer is, when you take out money from a targeted index fund, <clears throat> is has no like correlation to the year. That year simply is, is what dictates that glide path when it converts from stocks to bonds. The taxes or fee you might pay for withdrawing is based on what type of account it's in. So if it's in a Roth IRA and you want to take out some of the growth before you retire, then you would have to pay tax and penalty on the growth, but it doesn't matter if it's in a target date fund. That would be true for anything you're taking out of a Roth IRA. If it's in a regular brokerage account and you want to take money out of a, uh, a target date index fund, you can take out whatever you want. There's never a penalty, but you do pay tax on the growth um, called capital gains tax. All right, we're gonna answer one more question and then we're gonna be done. Um, Rodney asks, wait, I'll answer two because I've already looked at both and I like them both. Rodney asks, should I invest or pay off my home? They're both good options. Investing is the more aggressive option. It's more likely to have you more wealthy over time. Paying off your home is the more conservative option. You're more likely to not get kicked out of your home because you get foreclosed on. Um, you know, if you put into an Excel sheet, investing will come out ahead, uh, but life isn't an Excel sheet, right? You need to decide how much you like not having a uh, mortgage. You have to decide how risky your job is, things like that. But generally, if you're at that position where you're deciding between paying off your home and investing, they're both good options. Pick one, pick the other, do both, do some of both. I support you either way. And last question from Anna. She says, if you're a millionaire, how come you still have a Roth IRA? This is not an aggressive question, by the way. I'm just kidding. Um, probably done question, but it's confusing because it has limits. So that's a, that's actually a great question. So the limits only apply to the contributions. So I was putting money in for years when I was a poor person making $36,000 a year. Once that money is in there, it's good forever. It rides, right? But I can't add to it in years where I make over a certain amount of money. So that's what the limits are. And actually they're currently, I think some big changes are probably coming to the Roth IRA because Peter Thiel, one of the founders of PayPal, famously has like a $5 billion Roth IRA because he was like pulling some very tricky things. Um, and they, I think there's one proposal saying, hey, once you're over $10 million, you can't keep that money in the Roth IRA. You gotta take it out and actually pay some tax on it. Um, and I, I honestly think that's fine. You're like $10 million is a lot of money. And if you may have more than a Roth IRA, then I think it's fine, you know, doing your share to contribute. So there we go. We're over time. Thank you so much for coming to the webinar. It's been an absolute blast. Thank you all, 112070 for staying this long. Congratulations to Megan W for winning a course. Uh, we're going to give out a, a course tomorrow on Instagram uh, for that little snafu, unless there are two Meg Megan Ws. Also shows that Phoebe doesn't know the name of the girl I'm dating. Um, that's it. Thanks again. Buy the course. The sale is good through Monday. There's a button there. Go to personalfinanceclub.com. Personal Reminding you to build wealth by following the two rules of Personal Finance Club. Rule number one, live below your means. And rule number two, invest early and often. That's the end of the webinar. Have a great evening. Have a great Friday and have a great weekend. Bye, everybody.